Hey, this is Latif Mikado, and you're listening to the Good Night Freestyle Podcast, where I take some time each night to try and reflect on the freestyle scene, where it is, where it's going, and try to figure out how to sustain it, not just for future generations to enjoy, but also to benefit. So sit back, relax, and let's talk some freestyle. Hey, what's up, everybody? Latif here, and welcome to um, episode 11. Today is, um, it's Saturday, uh, January 11th, 2020. Today's a special day for me um, because it is my son Adam's birthday. Yep, so he's out of town, so of course I'm not going to see him. But um, spoke to him earlier. He's doing well. Um, he turned 29 years old. Unbelievable. 29 years old. He's my first child, my only boy. A lot of you guys know um, Erica. She's in the army. She just turned. Shoot, she just turned what? 19. <laughs> I'm losing track of my kids, man, the ages. Holy cow. Yeah, Erica uh, turned 18 in basic training and 19 in Germany. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> but um, they're both doing good. Um, yeah, Adam, um, Adam came at a, a very, very special time in my life. Very important time in my life. Um, for those who don't know, um, I spent a little time um, incarcerated, a few years, a couple of bits. Um, I was young. I had uh, I had no kids. Adam, when Adam was born, I was 24 years old. So, um, uh My, after my final bit, um, I knew when I came out, you see, I only had my mother. It was just my mother and I that, that lived, uh, we lived alone, just us two. I always, I have brothers and sisters, older and younger. The younger ones lived with my father and his family. And my mother, um, her, my brother and sister on that side uh, were already grown. So they were out of the house. So I was raised like a, a like an only child. However, I wasn't. Um, so, mom always worked. Mom, you know, mom might have gotten assistance before I could ever remember. I think maybe when she was younger. But when she, um, as long as I remember, she always worked. Because I either had a babysitter or when I got a little older, I was one of those uh, latchkey kids. Um, I used to come home from school. And um, uh, I used to go to the neighbor, and they had my key, and I would get the key from them because she wanted me to check in with them. They lived right across the hall, and then I would let myself in and lock the door until my mother got home. I had to call her as soon as I got in. So she had, like, food there, snacks there, stuff like that, so I don't burn down the house, whatever. But anyway, so it was a good life. You know, people would say, well, you didn't have your father, but... I had a great childhood. I mean, really, I I never experienced any of the financial hardships that a lot of family do. Not saying that she didn't, but she pretty much protected me from from that. I don't know if that's a good thing. Maybe it wasn't. But I've always tried to do it. I've never, when there was money issues, I never shared that with my children. I figured it out, you know? So... Um, but anyway, yeah, so when I was going in and out of the pen, I didn't have anyone that depended on me at all. If anything, I, I depended on my mom. So it was just her and I, um, I had my family, family pretty close, but of course when I went in, you know, life moves on and, you know, you can't expect anyone else 
mean, you're lucky if your if your if your parents are are still looking out or still at least communicating to kind of help you get through the situation that you're in. But you can't really expect much from anyone else. Everyone else has their own problems, and um. So mom was the one that was always there. She was the one that I could always call. She was the one that would send me money. She was the one that would come visit me. It was only her. Um. I might have gotten a visit or two from friends and a couple family members, but that was very early on. After that, you know, because I was, I, it was a revolving door. I kept going in and out. It's drug issues, you know. It's the '80s, Jackson Heights, Queens. I was born and raised in the Bronx, moved to Queens when I was about 10 years old. So this was during my teen years. So I lived in um, Jackson Heights, Queens. I lived in the heart, Roosevelt between uh, uh, 88th Street between Roosevelt and 37th Avenue. Anyone from Jackson Heights knows that area. And anyone who knows that area from the 80s knows that that was the cocaine capital of all of New York City. Uh, they told me it was because, um, is what I was told, uh, it was because we were so close to uh, LaGuardia Airport. Uh, a lot of Colombians, my, my neighborhood was like 97% Colombian. So um, it was a very... Whew, what a what a time that was. I mean, really, my neighborhood was like dawn of the dead. I swear, everyone was cracked out, man. It was it was really really bad. Um, and I remember my mom used to come out looking for me sometimes two three o'clock in the morning. And she'd just be in like her bathroom, man, just walking the streets trying to find her son. She told me that whenever um, she would hear ambulances, she would. Her heart would stop because she always thought it was, you know, it might have been me, you know. So when the time came and I did finally get caught and I got locked up, she was she was she was relieved. She was um. I went in there pretty skinny, so you know, prison in the beginning time, just maybe the first six months was was rough. I got tried, um, but it wasn't anything that was extreme. Nothing I couldn't handle. But I was tested a lot because of the way I came in. Um, that didn't last long, though. That didn't last long. Um, but anyway, so when I came out, my son was born in 91. So I believe I got out in very early 90. I think it was right after the holidays. So it was like maybe January of 1990 is when I got out and... So, I had my son. Well, I didn't. His mother did. But, and it was, it was, it was a very important time for me. And more so, uh, that I needed something to ground me. I really did. Before I got out, I was, I was pretty nervous. I was, I was. I was worried about the situation. I remember talking to some of the people in there that I was I used to get along with, the older guys. And um, I used to ask them, I used to tell them, they used to be like, yo, you short, you getting out soon. And I was kind of had this really weird kind of look to me because I was, I was nervous. I had done this thing so many times going in, you know, coming out, going back in, coming out. And I remember telling them, they were like, yo, how you feel, how you feel? And I finally... I opened up and I told him, I told him the truth. I was like, honestly, I'm scared. They were like, why are you scared for? I said, well, you know, this was a long bid. I said, I don't want to come in here anymore. And they were like, nah, you're going to be good, man. You're going to be good. But you know what? I was told that before that I was going to be good. So I wasn't sure. I wasn't sure. And I remember when I when I finally left, they actually, I went back to work release. I had to go to work release, and that was in uh, Queensboro. Anyone who's, <laughs> who, uh, who's been through my path knows what I mean when I say Queensboro. Uh, and that was the work release center. I went there for a little while. And that place even scared me because it was a possible trap off. I mean, it took, it didn't take much for you to be packed up and shipped back upstate. And if you went, if you violated work release in any way and, and what work release was in the city was you got out at a certain time and then you had to be back by a certain time and that was to look for work or to or to work so um, anyone who read my book Freestyle for Life 
the story in there about the guy who came out of prison and had to deal with his PO trying to find a job, that's basically my life, that part of it. Because people ask me, oh, is that like based on your life? Well, pieces of it is, and that piece certainly is. So if you read that piece, um, uh, when he meets up with P.O. Porter, which was also um, the name of my P.O. in real life. So it was a female. You know what I mean. And I described it to a T pretty much. <laughs> so hopefully hopefully she never reads the book. <laughs> Don't go looking for it, guys. <laughs> but uh, anyway, um, so when I came out, I was really worried. I was really worried. I did not want to go back in for anything. And when I had my son, the role that that played was a bit more than just having a son. And I don't know if it was selfish for me to do it that way, but I needed someone to be accountable to. My mom was my mom. I was, of course, you know, but I was so used to it. You know, I was so used to it. Now, here's a, a young, innocent life that I did not want to, I didn't want to disappoint. I didn't have my father growing up at all. At all, I saw him a few times. Um, I don't remember him being being a part of anything, any milestones, any gra- graduations or birthday parties. I don't remember. I think when I was really young, he was, but I don't remember. I don't remember getting gifts on Christmas, or I don't remember this stuff. I remember him promising me. He used to call me every year. I remember this. He used to call me and say, "Hey, well, you know, what do you want? Whether it was for my birthday or Christmas," and um. I think it was my birthday. And all I want, I don't know if you guys remember, it was little f- football games, electronic football games with the little dot that goes back and forth in you. And I wanted one of those so bad, man. And I told him, I said, I don't care if I don't get anything else. That's all I wanted. So he said, okay, and this is over the phone. So I gave my mother back the phone and I could hear her in the other room. And she's telling him, you better make sure if you say you're going to get him, get him that. You better get him. If you're not going to get it, tell me now because then I'll get it. That's what she said. So I guess he promised her that he was going to get it. So anyway, I never got it. <laughs> never owned one of those in my life. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> oh man, see, it's, it's crazy because it's these little things that, that, you know, you remember. So, you know, sometimes the most insignificant thing on earth, and you remember when you're a child, some things just pop out. I bet if I would have, you know, brought this up to my mom or to my dad, they're both passed, um, that neither one would have remembered this because it wasn't that big of an impact for them. But for me, I'm 53 years old. I must have been 10 years old because I moved to Queens when I was 10. So I, I couldn't be less than 10. I was at least 10 years old. Um, and I, I, didn't, I never forgot that. So, so anyway, when Adam was born, immediately, like I didn't know how I was going to react. I didn't know. I knew how I would, how I was with my mother, how my mother was with me. But I never had a male interaction. Never, never, you know, my uncles. But it wasn't like a father figure. I didn't have a father figure. My mother had a couple boyfriends, and I used to lie and called, you know, tell my friends, oh, it's my dad, it's my dad, <laughs> it was a lie, they, they weren't my dad, <laughs> you know, and um, I remember one of them, uh, my mother finding out, and she told me, from, you, you, you don't, don't call him, don't tell people he's your dad, and I remember the boyfriend was like, but that's okay, that's fine, he could do that, that's fine, my mother like, no, 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 he has a father, he doesn't need to do that. <laughs> so I remember that being a bit of, of, of a big deal, and I stopped doing that. Not really, though. I stopped doing it, you know, but I, I still lied. I told people my, my father was all kinds of things, a pilot. I remember telling people he was a pilot. That's why you never never saw him. Um, man, all kinds of <laughs> all kinds of stuff. But um, when Adam was born, I remember, man, just this connection it was the weirdest connection so strange like my mother used to make this say say this to me all the time and and you guys could probably relate and this is probably something you could one day tell your kids she used to tell me you will not understand 
how much I love you until you have your own child. And I used to laugh. Yeah, yeah, okay, whatever. <laughs> but as soon as I have my own child, now when the baby's first born, it's like, okay, you attached, da, da, da. But as they start gaining this personality and they start to smile and they start to know who you are, they, the attachment just like becomes like, it's almost like an octopus when they're first born has one tentacle on you. And then as they get older, a second, third, next thing you know, by the time they're fully blossomed with this personality, all eight tentacles are, have you wrapped and that's it. You know, you are attaching. This is when you get to the point where they're everything to you, your whole life, you know? I was raised by a woman. I've always been told since Adam was little that I was the nurturer. I was the one. It was always me and him. Always me and him. I used to, I used to have those backpacks that you you could put them in. You know, you put it on your stomach, of course, but... Um, those carriers, and I used to take him everywhere with me. I used to take him to meetings. I've taken him to the studio. And I remember this lady, or I have him in a stroller, I remember this lady, this lady, every time she saw me, like she, she used to always praise me, you know, because she was raising a daughter about my age, or younger than me, and the father was nowhere to be found. And so she used to see me and says, man, she goes, I, I see you, you're such an incredible father. And she goes, I can spot you from anywhere because you always have that stroller or you have always have that carrier and I'll never forget her telling me this so but you know <clears throat> I did a lot of things with my son I mean I it was just me and him like I said we used to go I used to come home from work I used to grab him we used to go Red Lobster I introduced him to all the restaurants and taught him how to how to order his food um, I told him how to leave a tip, even though a few times he would grab the tip when I wasn't looking. <laughs> and I'll be outside, and I'll see money in his hand, and it'll be a few dollars. I'm like, where did you get that money? He goes, oh, you left it on the table. I'm like, yo, what are you doing? <laughs> Give me that money. He used to have to run inside. I'm like, because these are restaurants I used to, I used to go to all the time, so I didn't want to diss their tips. <laughs> so... But um, but he was funny, and and it was the, the relationship was so crazy because by this time, when I was like 25, I was still a kid, and um, people used to always ask me, "Hey, is that your little brother?" And I say, "No, it's my son." And they were like, "Because of the way we were, you know, it was it was crazy." He played football and he boxed. I used to box for PAL. Um, I was tra- training for the for the um, for the Empire State Games Golden Gloves um, before I messed up, but I came. I went back when he was born. I went back to the same gym. This is the PAL that was in Flushing Meadow Park, and I brought him in. And one of the guys I used to spar actually, Zaz, who I'm in touch with now on Facebook, um, loved to. I'm, I love seeing him, man. When I saw him, I was so happy. But anyway, Zaz became his coach, and Adam. Could have been a contender, man. This guy was no joke. But like me, he lost interest, you know. He played football also. Again, man, incredibly skilled and tough. Right now, Adam's, what, 6'3", like 300-something pounds. So Adam is not a little boy. He's a big dude. He's bigger than me, you know. Um, And he's strong as hell. But when he was young, he was strong and he was fast. So he he had a lot of these skills, man. I remember I didn't have a car yet. Um, And I remember buying a bicycle, okay? And I got the pegs. So I used to put the pegs on the back. It was a regular, you know, a Huffy, like a 10-speed, but not with the stupid curly handlebars, the, the new school ones. And he used to put on all his equipment, helmet, shoulder pads, and get in the back and we used to go to the field because the field was only a few blocks away <coughs> and uh, so that was us man on the bike bringing him to the to the ballpark to the to the field and then riding back and you know we had a lot of you know a lot of great times I remember the way I lost the bike is I used to go to this bookshop with him all the time I always loved books and I used to leave the bike outside 
And he used to tell me, he was little, that's someone gonna steal that bike. Somebody gonna steal that bike. And I and then that went on for like, man, like uh, probably a couple of years that then one day somebody stole the bike. <laughs> <laughs> and he goes, I told you they were gonna steal that bike. I mean, he must have been like five years old by then. But what was so crazy too is something that Adam used to always tell me when he was little. I'm talking about from the minute he started making sense and we were talking and he, so maybe around five years old and, and up, no matter what we did, I don't know why he would ask me this. And he would ask me in this tone, Let's say I was pushing him on a swing, because this is the one I actually remember clearly. Where I used to go, we used to go to this park that was pretty much abandoned, like nobody ever went there. But I used to bring him there, because it wasn't far from where I lived, and I'm pushing him on the swing. And, you know, we're goofing around, and we're playing, I'm smacking his feet when they come back, and we're goofing, and he used to go, Daddy, did your daddy used to do this with you? That's exactly how he sounds. So, and I used to go, I told him the truth. I said, no, Adam. I said, my dad never, never pushed me on a swing before. And we went to the pool. We used to go to Storia Pool, just me and him. We used to jump on the bus and take the bus there. And um, I'll be playing with him in the water. And we're having a great time. I used to make him swim before he played. Because he was a little crybaby. I got to give him that. <laughs> he cried more than Erica did. You know, but he went to go play. I said, you can't play until you do a couple laps or you, you know, and because I always wanted to make sure he swims good because I was always scared of the water. I could swim good. My mother couldn't swim. <laughs> so she put the fear of water in me. And I always wanted to say, well, you know, if he ever goes with anybody, hangs out, at least he, he knows how to swim. And I'll be playing with him and out of nowhere, he would having a good time or we used to do this thing called Shamu where he used to get, get, get out. I get a lot of weight so it makes more sense now. <laughs> but he used to get on my back and put his, his his arms around my neck basically strangling me and I used to dive under the water and I used to swim real low to the bottom of the pool and just kind of go across the pool and he used to hold his breath and then he would tap me and that means come up and I would come on up and he would love it and we would just we would play like that all the time and he would go daddy did your daddy used to do this with you I used to be like no Adam I've never been to a pool with my dad <laughs> you know uh, the last time I went anywhere with my father he fell asleep on the grass, he was drunk, and we had to call my stepmother, well, my brother and sister's mother, to come pick us up at the park. And I remember when she drove to pick us up, to get us up, I told her, I said, well, we're not gonna wake him up. She said, no, leave him there. And she did, and she took us, so I can imagine how he woke up, <laughs> and we weren't there. Oh my God. <laughs> so, but um, but yeah. So you know, but I my you know I try to give my son the, the best childhood. When I um, when I started going on the road, I went on the road pretty. You know, I worked with Susie before he was, way before he was born. I started to work with her when I was in my teens. But um, when we started going on on the road, like when Take Me in Your Arms kicked off, um, we lived in the project, so I lived on the sixth floor. And you know how the project windows have the bars on them. And um, I used to have to, I used to get out early in the morning and I used to have to now walk to the bus, take the bus to the train, the train to Manhattan. And then I used to take um, the bus that goes to the airport from Manhattan. I think it was on 34th Street, I don't remember. And I used to take me to Newark because Susie lived at that time, she lived in Staten Island. So we used to, um, me at Newark Airport to go on the road. So I used to be leaving and out of nowhere, I used to hear, bye daddy. And I used to look up to the window and I can't see him because the windows don't open all the way and there's bars. But he used to stick his little hand out the window and just wave his fingers at me. And man, that used to kill me. I'm talking about now I'm walking to the bus with my eyes flooded. See, my whole thing at this point was, God, 
my son needs me, please make sure I get back home. That's how, that's how, that's what used to go through my mind when I go on the road. I always used to be extremely worried when I got on an airplane. Remember, I flew almost every week. And we flew long trips. There were always Texas or California, Chicago, you know, New Mexico, West Coast. It was always West Coast or Canada. So those trips were, and they weren't long. I was coming back the next day. But it was just, that's all it took was that one flight, that one plane to go down. And it terrified me, man, you know. And um, that's one of the discussions me and Susie has, which is why she kind of limits the amount of shows she does and where she goes to for that same reason. For that same reason. And I understand. I understand per- perfectly. But um, it was hard. It was hard. And But I used, to, I used to love coming back. You know, when my kids got older and they all had cell phones, right? Whenever I got on the plane, you know, you get there, you can sit there with your phone for a little while, play with your phone, do what you got to do. And then, be, but before they used to tell us to shut down our phones or turn them off, I used to put both my kids on one text and tell them that I loved them. And I wanted that to always be the absolute last text that I sent out before I went anywhere. So, you know, this was, the, I was with Angel, so I didn't send it to Angel because Angel was with me. <laughs> so if I, if she wasn't, if I was with Susie, then yeah, different, different story. She, you know, I always send her a text and, you know, and um, I remember doing this just till the other day, you know, till the other day. So, and I think I'll still do it actually now, you know, now, now I'm thinking about it. They're grown and now Eric is out of the house and in Germany, but she still gets my text because we, we communicate quite a bit, you know? So, but anyway, um, you know, uh, I know this didn't have much to do with freestyle, um, but this was what was on my mind tonight, you know, my son, you know, and how fortunate I am uh, to have a, to have him in my life, you know, my kids, you know, and uh, they grow fast. Any of you guys who, now I got my granddaughter. She's here only because, you know, she goes to school here. But I look at them like they're my kids, you know. And I see how fast they, they're growing. I see how much, how smart they are. And, you know, and it's like, you know, thank you, God, man. Thank you, you know, for giving me this. You know, this is a, it's a beautiful thing. So, yeah, anybody who has children, especially little children, I don't want to scare you. But, man, they grow fast. I swear. And then once they grow, they grow. Then from there, it seems to like quadruple in speed. It's it's the weirdest thing. It's the weirdest thing. When we were kids, we remember, ah, oh, I can't wait till I'm 18. And that took forever. But then when you hit 18, next thing you know, you're 30. And then you're 40 and 50. It's like all the other numbers disappear. I remember going from 30 to 40 to 50, <laughs> you know? So... But anyway, so um, I just want to kind of share that with you guys. I hope, hope it didn't bore you. <laughs> but um, so I just want to say happy birthday, Adam. I love you, man. Um, God bless you. And uh, to everybody else, good night, Freestyle. Before I lay me down to sleep, I pray to hear a freestyle beat. For if I die before I wake, I hope to make it to the break.